Good afternoon. I'm Tom Carmen, and I serve as chair of Advocate Drum. Thank you so much for joining us for another exciting edition of Interviews and Insights. As we begin, I want to thank National Grid as our corporate sponsor of this event. This series would not be possible without their support. We are thrilled today to have the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, with us today. Sergeant Major Grinston is the personal advisor to the Army Chief of Staff on all matters that affect the enlisted force. We look forward to what he has to say about today's soldiers and families. Sergeant Major, Major Grinston is a true leader and an artilleryman. He got to share these skills with the 10th Mountain Division soldiers when he served as the Command Sergeant Major of the 215 Field Artillery 2nd Brigade Combat Team. Sergeant Major, we're really pleased to have you join us today and we welcome you back to the North Country, even if it's just virtually. Advocate Drum also welcomes Alex Hazard back to the interviewer's chair today. Uh, Alex is well known to all of us. He serves as the lifestyle host on North Country television affiliate, ABC 50. And with that, and with no further ado, Alex, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom and Sergeant Major. What an honor to spend some time with you this afternoon. Thanks for taking the time. No, thanks for uh, having me. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So before we get started into your role and the current happenings in the Army, we thought it might just be nice to get a little insight, pun intended, into your personal background and what kind of drew you into this role originally or this line of work. <laughs> Alex, thanks. So what drew me into the Army? Um, well, that's a long time ago. I mean, that's uh, 30, it's hard to remember, 33 years now, almost in a few days, it's going to be 34. So it's been a long time. So I, I think what initially drew me into the military was at that time I was, you know, I needed the college money. That's just it's pretty simple. Yeah, I was a young 19 year old college student and I was attending at the time uh, Mississippi State University was still going to school. And all of a sudden recruiter talked to me and said, hey, you know, we could pay for all this for you and you wouldn't come out with a big bill. So, um, yeah, that's what kind of drew me in. And I'd say that's not, you know, why did I stay for 34 years is usually a you know better question. Um, it's just sometimes over a period of times, I just enjoyed what I was doing. I had kept having great opportunities. And, you know, it was really about, and then later it became about the people. You know, the more, the longer I stayed and the more I enjoyed, the more I could help soldiers. That's, that was really the impetus on why I stayed so long and why I continue to do what I do. Now, here's the thing. There's only one Sergeant Major of the Army, but I'd be willing to bet that a lot of folks that are average Joes like me, aside from knowing that the role is obviously super important, might not be familiar with what it is that you do on a grand scale and on the day-to-day. -day. So can you just break that down for us? Well, I like to probably need a couple more hours to, to kind of all that down. Um, and what you said is kind of, you know, it's my, you, it's kind of like my running joke because I say, well, um, when people meet me, they'll go, hi, what do you do? And I, you know, say I'm in the army. And then they go, well, what do you do in the army? And I'll go, you know, I work in the Pentagon. And then eventually they'll, they'll really want to dig in. So what do you do? So, and sometimes I'll go, I'm the Sergeant Major of the Army. And I think what they hear is I'm a Sergeant in the Army. And <laughs> I go, uh, so uh, it's quite interesting uh, is that a lot of people don't really realize the roles and responsibilities of the Sergeant Major of the Army. And that makes it for me really exciting. Um, I, I enjoy my job. And why is it exciting that people don't know the roles is because that if you, maybe you knew the roles then maybe I wouldn't get those candid conversations on all the things that we do. So I, I really like uh, getting candid feedback for how the army is doing. So what are my roles? So the first and foremost, the main you know job that I have is I advise the chief of staff of the army and the secretary of the army on all enlisted matters. So, but I think 
it really expands even larger than that because it sounds like all enlisted matters. And I say that, but it really is a lot of soldier matters. So sometimes when I'm looking at quality of life, and recently in the last year, we really put a lot of emphasis on getting our exceptionally uh, f exceptional family member program working better. Well, there are officers and enlisted you know, family members that have family members in that program. So I'm down there trying to say, OK, uh, from a Department of Army policy perspective, do we have the policies right for those family members? If we don't, then I come back to the Pentagon, I work with the folks that work the policies and do we have the funding? And then we try to get that right to make it better for the soldiers down in the organization. So that's, that's I do that all the time. There's like a thousand of those programs that I try to help uh, make better for the Army. And then sometimes that's the total Army, not just the active, but also the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve. So when we look at policy, that that spans a lot of all three compos and some of the policies we work on, you know, for quality of life is not just enlisted, um, but there are primary duties I do on the enlisted side. Um, it, but I just kind of stopped there because it really could be a long conversation, but uh, on some of those things for enlisted, uh, where I just say one of those things that we highlight when you look at professional military education throughout the entire army, uh, I look at that too. And, and at some point I have oversight of that too. So that's just a very quick uh, venue of what I do uh, for the army. Well, thank you for that. And from one thing that could be a long answer to maybe another one, <laughs> if it's okay with you, I'm just going to list off a few of the topics of headlines we're seeing right now. Obviously COVID, school attendance policies, accessing affordable childcare, uh, growing inflation. Hold on, I'm gonna keep going here for a second. <laughs> a national employment crisis, broken supply chains, change, uh, climate change, and of course, the Afghanistan withdrawal. So these things must be affecting soldiers and really the army as a whole. Broadly, how are the soldiers doing and what is the army doing to get through so much at once? You threw a lot at me. I know, and I didn't mean to do that, but there's so much going on. It's, I mean, how, how's the Army doing? How are the soldiers doing? Alex, you know, I'm being honest with you. I, I did say this, you know, yeah, you threw a lot at me. But I said that deliberately is because, you know, interestingly enough, that's what the Army does. <laughs> We're used to having a lot of things for that. It's just like, you know. And, you know, in my tenure, I took over in August of 2019 with the Chief of Staff of the Army in the same day. So um, we've had COVID, um, you know, that kind of coming up. And then we had some civil unrest. We had the highest hurricane season that we ever had in like 100 years in 2020. We also, at one point in time, we had hurricanes and forest fires all. So on the East Coast, the East Coast was flooding and the West Coast was burning. And we, you know, we were dealing with all that at the same time. Then we throw an election and it was contested. Then you had things in the Capitol. You throw in, hey, let's go back to Afghanistan. And through all that, you know, your army has been there. And as simple as it, as it sounds is this is what we do. Everything you said, you know, we're like, okay, well, you want to help with COVID. Um, we, uh, it almost sounds like we had this already so we had we developed these urban augmentation task force where the united states army reserve made 80 it was like an 85 person team of doctors and nurses and medics to go out to help places like new york city washington and then our core of engineers you know developed these the javits center where you can bring in a whole bunch of COVID patients so every time that we've been asked to do this as an army, you know, we said, yeah, we'll do it. But behind that, you know, how are our soldiers doing? You know, fundamentally, yeah, they're, they're dealing with all these things at the same time, but our soldiers are really resilient and we keep asking them to do these things. And, you know, August was one of those where we said, hey, we just want to take the 82nd and go back to Afghanistan. And it sounds so simple, 
Um, but most countries don't just fly a brigade halfway around the world, go protect and move out 120,000 people in, you know, two to three weeks. And then we fly back and everybody goes, hey, that, that seemed like uh, it went okay. Or, well, it, it, it was really difficult. That is one of the most complex tasks that any place could do. And then the forefront of all that is your soldiers. So yes, our soldiers and our families are dealing with a lot of that. We're doing all those missions. Um, I'm not saying, you know, you know, we're not struggling with some of these problems and you can see, you know, some of these issues that we are, we are dealing with as an army. Um, suicide is one of those. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, we're doing well with suicides. We got to do better. But fundamentally, your army has been there at the forefront through all that. And we're going to continue to be there for our country and uh, our, our soldiers. So we're, we can do this. Uh, it sounds hard. It sounds, and it is extremely difficult, but our soldiers have been, you know, really resilient. And I'm really proud of what we've done, especially in the last two years. Well, shifting gears here a little bit, and you've touched a little bit on this. You have a few very important initiatives that I hope to get to today. Um, but one of which is, this is my squad. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, you know, this is my squad is really how we fundamentally, you know, deal with each other. It's about a culture change. And some people say, what do you mean a culture change? Well, um, I wouldn't say, say we had a bad culture. We had, you know, we've always had, I think, an extremely good culture. Um, but when I came in, maybe 30, seems like, you know, forever ago, um, you know, we were extreme mission focused. You know, mission first, you know, and just get the mission no matter what. And we still have the same mentality. We have to leave whatever mission we begin without a doubt. But don't forget that those missions that we're asking our soldiers to do, there is a person behind that mission. So when I think of my squad, it's the, the culture of that we take care of each other and we know each other so that our soldiers can be prepared for the missions that we've been asked to do. And when I say squad, some people thought I meant, you know, a rifle infantry squad. A squad, you know, more like a term of endearment. It means, you know, the people that I'm close to. Um, it doesn't mean everybody. Some people say, well, the whole army is in my squad is the Sergeant Major of the Army. I said, I disagree. Those people that know you, it's, it's making sure we know each other and we understand that we are different. We understand that you have differences of opinion. We know that and we can talk about those and we can disagree. It's almost like, you know, your family, you love them. Sometimes you hate them. And so, but having that culture where we know each other so well that if something's going wrong, we can identify it. If we disagree, we can have that argument. Um, but we also take care of each other. And that's that's that culture where you're not afraid to step in. You're not afraid to correct somebody. In your family, you can always say, hey, you know, we don't do that. Or we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. And you don't, doesn't mean you don't like them. Don't mean you don't love them. You just make that correction because you're part of the family. So it's having that culture where you can build a cohesive team and you can do that, uh, that's highly trained, disciplined and fit, that's grounded in trust. And when you trust each other, all that becomes easier. Uh, and you can have those conversations. Uh, you can disagree. You can train real hard. Man, that was terrible. And it was really tough. Um, but you can do that because you're a cohesive team and you got trust with each other. You trust that you're going to do your job. I'm going to do my job. So this, again, is about a, a culture where we know the person sitting right next to us so we can do all the missions that we've been asked to do. It's nice to hear and uh, so important. Now, two top priorities and challenges for the Army, recruitment and retention. So how are you working on this and what messages should folks in communities like ours know when it comes particularly to these issues? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go, there's two distinct missions. I will start with uh, sessions or we, you know, recruitment into the military is we have to continuously, you know, talk about what we do. And there's sometimes there's some stigmas out there that 
I always find astounding. So um, I went one time and I was talking to school superintendents, uh, and I won't tell you where. So I was talking to school superintendents at a location, and somehow they started talking about, you know, the military, and then all of a sudden they started talking about, you know, infantry soldiers and that mantra, you know, of, you know, the dumb grunt, you know, mentality. And I'm like, that's really interesting. And I said, um, sitting right next to me, I said this, I said, you know, sitting right next to me is the secretary of the army who was in a ranger battalion and he's leading, he's the leader of your, your army. <laughs> so that's number one. And oh, by the way, right next to him was a, a congressman and uh, he was also an infantry soldier that you elected as one of your elected officials in your state. And uh, he's leading your state. <laughs> so uh, it was completely fascinating that uh, those stigmas out there, some of the best leaders I've ever met have been entry. And uh, oh, by the way, they're some of the smartest. And I look at General Milley. Uh, General Milley graduated from Princeton. <laughs> so uh, fighting those mantras with the sessions uh, of what we are and what we stand for as an army, uh, and that's just one of those, but there's a lot of them out there. We, we have great programs in the army. Um, and we take care of our, our, our soldiers and our families like no other organization I've ever seen. And so far, we've met our accessions goals. <laughs> so we haven't, um, um, you know, seen a, a big drop. Even with COVID, we still have all the goals that we met. Uh, our end state for this year was for the active component was 485,000. We were at 485,000, meaning we brought all the people we needed to bring in. And that's one point. And the second one is on retention. And so keeping soldiers, not just, you know, we get them in and then, you know, they all get out. Um, this year and for the last several years, we've met our recruit, uh, our retention goals, meaning keeping soldiers in. So we, right now, we have not seen any issues with either accessions or retention. And that's meeting the goals of what we've asked the, the Army to do. And it's all about the in-state number, which was for the active component was 485,000. We met both of those in the last two years. Uh, to that point, after these young soldiers are through the door doing basic training, what sort of things are being implemented during basic training to help with skills that not only help with that physical readiness, but the mental readiness and the cognitive skills? Yes, yeah, so we did have to change some of how we do uh, based on COVID. And I, I think it actually helped us out a little bit. So to help us, so the, we have two weeks where you know, we just kind of bring them into our culture. And that's where we start working on those mental resiliency skills, those cognitive skills. They stay in PT uniform. And then after a couple of weeks, we make sure they're ready to go. And then we pass them off and they start the official basic training where, uh, you know, what would you'd probably say was in the movies. And I think that's where we could, you know, start working on those those basics and those fundamentals. And because of that, that that makes them a little bit more resilient, uh, either mentally and physically. We don't just come in and then throw them, you know, out there, uh, you know, and try to do those really difficult physical things. And we saw that we were injuring our soldiers when we were doing that. So that helped us out. Uh, but it also that two weeks gives us a chance to build some of those resiliency skills before we pass them off some of those more difficult, you know, uh, mental, mentally challenging tasks. So when you go through something physical, that's a mental challenge too, especially, you know, when you're doing those foot marches, it's like, oh, you know, can I make this distance, whatever that is. So, but not, not only that, we are working a lot with our basic training on mental, like mindfulness training and how do you, do some meditation, just say positive. We've got some uh, cognitive coaches out there and they, they go out to places like ranges. So if you miss a target, what are you thinking about? You know, you know, don't get stressed. You know, how do you, how can you react once you do something like you miss a target or do something? So we, we've put a lot of emphasis on that. So we do have cognitive coaches out in basic training. We also have them on our installations too. To help with some of the mental resiliency. Great. Well, you know, talent management for any organization is important. And I know that you have 
been doing some very exciting things in the Army to address talent management, especially um, for leadership assignments, for example. Can you share with our audience what you're working on here? Well, we started with the Battalion Commander's Assessment Program by the Chief of Staff of the Army. And that was the first assessment that we ran. And two years ago, that was just kind of the foundation. And so once they they did the battalion commander's assessment. We said, well, how are we going to, you know, do we need to do an assessment on the enlisted side? The answer was yes. And then um, a whole bunch of old sergeant majors got together, is what I call it. And we said, well, where do we think we need to start? We said, actually, the first sergeant's uh, the assessment program. So the first sergeant is at the company battery troop level, which leads, you know, about 100, 150 soldiers. And that's where the large you know, majority of our enlisted reside in a bad a company battery troop level. So we wanted that assessment. If that person for enlisted is is usually the more senior person. Not the the commander is obviously in charge, but a a typical first sergeant has been in the army almost twice as long as the commander, you know, at that level. Not so true at battalion commander level. So we said that's the level that we want to start our assessments because if that person has been in the army a lot longer, they'll have a lot of influence at the company by the troop level. And we want to get that right. So we've run several pilots on the assessments. So that's that's where we started uh, several pilots on the assessments for the first sergeant's level. And we're looking to get that fully implemented this year or, or the beginning of next year, the physical year. Uh, not the calendar year or so in October, hopefully no later than then. But it's difficult because the Army is so large. So we're doing an, an assessment at the company battery troop level to know to provide the best first sergeant at the that level that we can provide. But like uh, you said, like I said earlier, we could do more than uh, one thing at one time. So in November, we'll do an assessment at the brigade level for the sergeant major assessment program. So in November, um, uh, they've already gone to a board. So meaning they'll have a paper board. They looked at all their records. They looked at their schools and said, these people, have, based off the paper, they're, they're doing well. And then they'll go to Fort Knox and then they'll go to an assessment. They do cognitive and non-cognitive assessment. We'll do a, a survey of soldiers that have, uh, work with them in the past and they'll fill that out and then they'll do a blind board so they'll be behind a screen and then they'll ask uh, some questions they'll they'll see an operational psychologist and they'll do assessment and i feel all that we're going to provide the, the best leaders we can at the brigade level and then that will be complete in the end of november so those are the two big assessments we have going this year um, and looking at talent management. So we're, we're also hopeful to get the, the in-between. So we did the company battery troop and then brigade was that one for us, you know, that one thing is missing is battalion. Um, and we're going to run a pilot at the Sergeant Majors Academy on how we could do an assessment, similar things, cognitive, non-cognitive, physical assessment, uh, blind board, some other things at the Sergeant Majors Academy for the battalion level. So we're heading in the right direction. And all this, ultimately, talent management is to provide the best leaders that we can for our soldiers. Not that we're doing poorly now, but we can do better. And that's, that's the whole goal. So that uh, we can really move the Army uh, into the future. Uh, Sergeant Major, uh, shifting gears again here. Uh, to some lessons that my mom taught me growing up. Uh, one, of course, is that it's not intentions that matter, but instead outcomes, and not to make excuses, but to make solutions, both things I'm still working on. But I recently read an article in the Defense News where you discuss a new initiative that you've implemented called the Solutions Summit, which reminded me of these lessons a little bit. Can you tell us uh, what you're trying to achieve here? Because uh, I think it's pretty great. The solution separate. So in in June, um, well, I'll even go back. So two years ago, I, you know, I you know was just now brand new, started in the army. So 
as I came in as a Sergeant Major of the Army, we used to do, and we still do, we do this big summit once a year. We come in and we go, um, let's get together and we get a lot of information. And information is really good, so you know, that's not a bad thing. But I wanted to do more. And I wanted to come in and say, you know, what, what really difficult things are we going to work on um, for this year? Um, so we kind of retooled our annual summit and we said, here's the, the harmful things that, that are really plaguing our army. And we looked at sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment. We said that was one, suicides and racism, extremism. And then we broke it down to a, a group and we, we really tackled it and said, how can we uh, do this better? And we looked at it from an aim point. And then there was these waypoints with this new idea. What, and, but we didn't know what the new idea was. So we, so we had a class on how we think these small groups were going to go. Uh, but we knew the aim point. So, well, maybe we did know the aim point. Maybe we didn't. So I actually set the aim point. And we brought in uh, someone to help us with this. We actually brought in an author of a book that I read that I thought was really good called Upstream um, by Dan Heath. And we looked at, he talked to us about these aim points and, you know, waypoints and things in between. And, um, and then he said, you know, maybe you should fix the aim point because then everybody knows where to go. And, and I'll give you an example was, you know, we want, you know, zero suicides. And, and everybody's like, oh, you know, can we do that? Yeah. So, but we know we all want zero suicides. Fix right. that point. So we fixed that. We want zero sexual assaults and sexual harassments in the army. And we fixed it. And we said, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to drive to. Because anything less than that is unacceptable. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe we don't get there, but we know what the point was. But then what are those things? that we could do those little things that we could do to get back at that aim point. And, and how do we make that connection? And the reason I'm talking about this so much, because that's how, that's what came out of that was we had a few ideas. One of the ideas was how can we bring soldiers in a first 180 days and that first 180 days, um, does that, are we going to have zero sexual assaults? sexual harassments, zero suicides in 180 days. And if we get that first 180 days right, would we have, you know, zero sexual assaults and sexual uh, harassment and zero suicides for the entire term that soldier was in? So the, the end state was zero, uh, but focus at that first 180 days. So we said, yep, we should really focus in on that. And then we left and was like, okay, good. We're going to do this. And then I thought, well, you know, is that going to be enough that we just come back together and have that discussion a, a year from now? Is that really going to be effective? And, and, I, and then I realized, and this is part of my, you know, self-discovery, I guess, is I, I, I made a mistake is that we have to look at this every month or we're never going to get to that aim point. We're never going to drive this down at all. We got to all come together. And it's not about, um, you know, assigning blame. It's not about, it's about commitment and sharing lessons learned on the aim points. So when we get a great idea, you know, we can't wait another year before we share that year idea because yes, you know, 10 years from now, you're going to have the same discussion or you finally fixed it. I don't, I don't want to wait 10 years to get to my aim point. I want it to be next year. So in order to do that, I have to meet every month. Uh, and that's where the Solution Summit came from. We had the big summit. We brought everybody in, tackled those, had some great ideas. But coming back together each month and saying it's working or it's not working. If it's not working, kill it. <laughs> and then had come up with a new idea. Um, so it's not about compliance. It's about commitment and then sharing a lesson learned on what's working at your installation very quickly in an extremely large organization like the Army that spans the globe with 1.1 million people. That's hard to get a lesson learned and it's hard to change and get to those aim points 
if you're not sharing ideas and 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 measuring it. How do we measure it? What does it look like? If something doesn't happen, what does that look like? So uh, it's been difficult because it's not as clear as you know we want it to be, and it's designed that way. It's hard, you know, and that's why you know it's it's a difficult problem. And to take it on and say zero that that is a challenge, but. I'm confident that we can do this, but we had to look at it every month and share those ideas, new ideas and lessons learned. We've got a lot of great ideas out of that. And I think we, we are extremely hopeful that next year when we come together and we look at our data, those negatives have gone down and, and the positives have gone up. Um, those positives being the things we want. We want, you know, masters of their uh, of their skills, those highly trained, and how do we measure that? Those, those are the positive. Physical fitness scores going up, resiliency going up, um, all these positive things. And then on the negatives, they're going down, less sexual assaults, less suicides. And that's why we really tailored it to this monthly summit so that we, and we stay focused just on those three ideas and how do we get to that aim point, which is zero. Fantastic. Well, there's been a lot of discussion with what to do about soldiers disobeying the order to get vaccinated for COVID-19 and that they could be separated from the Army or even dishonorably discharged. At this point, where does this stand and how many soldiers do you think are going to be impacted by this? I'm hoping uh, uh, zero. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yes, that's, that's uh, you know, hopeful. So that's the way we put it out, I think is also you know we don't know you know that's why we went with a phase one and a phase two just to be honest is you know phase one is just trying to say okay this is mandatory go get your vaccine so you know we're gonna okay immediately if you're a leader you know you're going to be suspended and that's one thing i wanted to make sure that if our soldiers are going to be held accountable our leaders are going to be held accountable first <laughs> so so that, that's why it's phases. So we really don't know the number until we really put a, a little bit more pressure on those. If you don't get the vaccine, you're gonna be counseled. And then um, if then you're gonna go see the doctor, you're gonna talk to a doctor. And if you still get the vaccine, then you're gonna get a, you know, a general officer uh, memorandum for record, a GOMAR. And then, you know, and then, and then after we get those numbers that still don't want to get it, that's when, you know, that's why it says on order, we get phase two. So that's the on order is trying to see how many folks after that, you know, we relieve, you know, commanders and, and, you know, senior CSMs and first sergeants, if you don't get it, you've gotten a general officer uh, memorandum for record in your file. And if that doesn't come in, and then we're going to go to phase two and say, okay, maybe it's time for separation. So again, I'm still hopeful the number is going to be zero. Everybody's going to, you know, understand and get the vaccination. And then the story that I like the the basis off of that really hits home for me is body armor. And most people go, what does that have to do with a, a shot in the arm? And I say, well, Imagine that we develop this really good body armor and it really protects you. Now, with any body armor, maybe, you know, the, the bomb is so big that's, you know, something happens, you had the body armor on. But imagine that I said, uh, I have the body armor and I'm going to make you wear it. And then you would, you would want me as a Sergeant Major of the Army to force you to wear that body armor. And then imagine I had it and I didn't even give it to you. And I said, well, it's optional. Um, but when you died, you know, that I would be held accountable. And I mean, that would just be really bad. So I, that's the way I kind of look at the vaccine. We have something, um, you know, and it helps you with whatever you're going through right now. And why the Secretary of Defense all told us, get the vaccine. And I, I equate it to... I have something that could really help you. And it would, I'd be a terrible person if we didn't make you get it. So I think we have to get the vaccine. And we have seen, um, you know, our numbers really decrease lately on, on, you know, who's getting, you know, COVID. But the numbers of folks that 
have had the vaccine that have died is very small. And most of the soldiers that have died uh, have been unvaccinated. And that's why I'm just, I couldn't be more passionate about please get the vaccine. And oh, by the way, it's an order, so it's not so much please anymore. It's more like get the vaccine. Well, you often talk publicly about the Army's need to focus more on quality of life concerns. And there are of, are, of course, a lot of those, but two of which I think are kind of related are both spousal employment and permanent change of station. You touched a little bit uh, on, uh, on those earlier, but what are your thoughts here? Well, when I look at, you know, how you, you really talked about it when you said accessions and retention. So if you want soldiers to stay in the Army, I mean, I think we really have to look at, you know, how are we doing with spouse employment and, you know, PCS moves and all the quality of life, you know, um, housing and the five quality of life that the chief of staff told us we really need to look at was housing, health care, child care, spouse employment, and PCS moves. So the, just those two, spouse employment, I look at this as this untapped resource that our whole country needs right now. We actually need people to work. And so I actually was talking to the Department of Labor and I said, you know, if we, if the Department of Labor could help us with our moves and our, our spouses get employed at new locations, I'll give one of those examples would be when we moved from state to state for the military, um, our, my spouse may have a license that their license, I'll give you one example, and this is a true story. Uh, we had, she was a licensed, not my spouse, but a spouse that was licensed behavioral health specialist. And she moved from Washington state to Kentucky and she was no longer licensed. We need more behavioral health specialists, but because she moved from Washington to Kentucky, she had to go through more classes. Now, what we've done was we'll say we used to pay $500 to get relicensed. Now we'll go up to $1,000. If you move from state to state in a PCS move and you need to recertify, we'll pay that certification to get you done, to get you back relicensed again. But what we really like is some legislative help to say, why don't we just say, you know, some state reciprocity as you move from state to state on some of these highly skilled jobs? So that's where we're, we're looking at, but we are doing our job to say, if you have to go get relicensed in that state, please uh, look at look to us, we can give you a thousand dollars to go get that license. But we still, we're trying to make it as easy as we can to keep our spouses employed. If you work at a child development center and you move from one state to the next, uh, or not another state to the next, but if you move one post to the next post, and you want to get the job, we'll go ahead and qualify you for that job before you even move. So it's the job's waiting for you when you get there. So we we really put a lot of emphasis on spouse employment, and we're going to continue to do that and because we we ask a lot of our family members, and the the best we can do the you know we can do more as we move from location to location uh, to keep them employed, and our country kind of needs it um, now. In the on PCS moves, we got a lot of things going on. We're we're, try, we're really trying to get there um, with uh, with moving our soldiers from one location. And man, COVID really put a damper on everybody on this one. You know, you can see this up in I think it was New York to ask the, the National Guard just to drive the school buses. So we don't have enough commercial drivers license uh, people in the in the country right now. And that's who moves our household goods. So there's been a lot of delays in household good moves. And that's some of those things we just can't control. But what we can control is uh, we've increased the amount of uh, temporary lodging expense. I think it was 10 days. We went to 60 days. So if you're going to stay in that hotel, we're going to pay up to 60 days before it was only 10. Uh, so that's one thing. And if, and then we said, well, if you're, if you're supposed to be at your next duty assignment is for a drum, you're supposed to be there in the tent. And for some reason, transportation can't get you there. You can go 20 days past your report date. So we, we've kind of changed the orders up. We're really trying to, to get everybody moving. Here's one thing I have asked all the soldiers, please. 
if you're struggling with a PCS move, don't go at it alone. Ask your leaders, ask somebody to help. Because we've just got these great soldiers that will just go out there and do these extraordinary things. And like, oh, wife, see you later. I got to be at Fort Drum on the 10th. Good luck with the family, the kids, the dog, the cars, and pack up the house. I got to go to work. Uh, don't do that. Please reach out if you can't make that extra 20 days pass. Don't, don't do that um, because we found some like, yeah, my husband just left, you know, and the, the family's all mad. Uh, so it asked us not to do that. So we are in extraordinary times. The whole country is struggling with all those things. And you said it, you know, you already said all those things that we're looking at. And that's affecting our moves. And we're trying to do our best that we can. We've increased the amount of money um, that you can get if you want to move yourself. And that's probably the best course of action if you're not going overseas. Throw your stuff in the truck. We've tried to make it as easy as we can. We used to have to make, you take the truck, you rent the truck, you drive the truck, go get the truck weighed, empty, and then you got to bring the truck back, fill all your stuff up, and then go get it weighed again when it's awful. I was like, okay, there's a thing on the side of the truck that says how much the truck weighs. Could we use that? <laughs> Save me. You know, the, and it's got to be a special scale and all this stuff. I don't even know where the scales are. So we, we're, we're doing all that. We said, no, that's, we don't need to do that anymore. Take the thing, take the sticker off the, the truck. That's it. You wait. And then when you weigh it, we do have to weigh it because it's full because we go by a pound. So uh, we, we're doing a lot of things with PCS moves. I just kind of scratched the surface on a few of those, but uh, there's a few more. But uh, we're going to dig in and, and do our best to make sure our families are taken care of as they move. The old kiss. Keep it simple. We'll say sweetheart. <laughs> well, ending on a couple of a uh, couple of lighter topics here. I've heard of an honorary doctorate, but never an honorary sergeant major of the army. Apparently, this is a thing. And recent and recently, you chose to award Denzel Washington. How did this come to be? Well, you know, I met uh, Denzel Watson. He's kind of walked around the Pentagon, and and during COVID, he has his mask on, you know, unassuming, and just like you know, people walk around the Pentagon all the time. And and I, when I met him for the first time, and he's just a very humble kind of person, and and just you know, his the way he talked about his army, that's what really got me. Just by meeting, and you know, the 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 empathy he had for us as soldiers, the respect he had, that kind of kind of got my attention. And then we did a little bit of digging and it just this wonderful story about him one day. Uh, it's been, you know, several years ago. And he's, somebody said, well, you know, these houses with the Fisher house, you know, really support families when they're in need. He said, well, let me, let me just go ahead and fund one of those real quick. <laughs> so, uh, that was really what kind of sent me over the edge. Some of the things that he's done to support his military uh, was has been phenomenal. We only recognize one individual every year that has lifelong commitment to the military. And I thought, what a better person that, to, to represent the military uh, and his attitude and everything that he's done uh, for us in the past has been really uh, well done. And, and so I nominated him and we got a few of the other Sergeant Majors of the Armies and we had this discussion and he was selected. And it's just one of those things just to say for those people that uh, maybe never even served, sometimes it is an actually uh, active duty, so uh, not an active duty soldier. We've had one enlisted soldier actually be an honorary Sergeant Major of the Army. It's just a way of just saying thank you for your lifelong support to, to your military at the highest level. So. That's why we selected him, and, and we we're really appreciative that he accepted this uh, nomination and award. Well, before we go, uh, of course, I want to thank you, Sergeant Major, one last time and ask you maybe to just leave us on one word of advice that, uh, the, of one word of advice that we as community members can do to support the Army that supports us so nicely. I, I would just say that we're your Army. <laughs> It's not somebody else's army. We're, we're not aliens. You know, you know, uh, we're uh, we're just right there on the other side. Sometimes uh, a lot of gates, and you know, get to know us uh, on a different level. Just get out there and talk uh, to your army 
and anything you can do to, uh, to help us hire and inspire uh, those young men and women that would want to be a part of our great organization, organization is probably the most helpful thing that you can do. I think this is a great start uh, for anybody you know, in the world. I mean, just imagine all the things that we do as a military and a young man or woman starting your life out to give back to, to your country and serve your country, even if it's, you know, for a few years or if it's for 34 years, I think would be a great place to start. So hire and inspire those young individuals to join their your army. And that's what I would uh, ask you all to do to help in the community. Well, thank you one last time to our sponsor, National Grid, Advocate Drum, and of course to you, Sergeant Major. It's been a delight and an honor.